Our next speaker is Daniel Almaguer. He met the Victoria Crown Pigeon at age seven and has been involved with them his entire life. And he will have a special surprise for us if you stay till the end. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is my first presentation, so if I kind of stutter every now and then, I forgive me. But uh, again, uh, my name is Daniel Almaguer. I'm from originally from Gonzales, Texas, graduate of Texas State University. And it is a real pleasure to be here. Uh, Victoria Crown Pigeon started when I was seven years old, San Antonio Zoo. I saw them and I said, someday, I'm gonna have those birds. I started with chickens when I was 17, got my uh, white rheas from Mr. Chatfield over here, and uh, went on and to get other things, very bluebirds, and moved on. Now I really wanna get, work more with the uh, Victoria Crown Pigeons as much as possible. So I have right now one pair, one is from a zoo, one is from the private sector, and I successfully raised one one chick so far. I have an egg in the incubator and we'll keep our fingers crossed. But uh, we'll go ahead and move through that. And I worked as a bird keeper at Animal Kingdom in the Asia Aviary for a while and I really enjoyed it. We had several fruit pigeons and we had the Victoria Crown pigeons. And I learned a lot there from the private sector. Uh, keeping records is so important that I do that now. So I really stress if you have a private collection, uh, keeping records is uh, of the utmost importance. So keep records and we're going to go ahead and start. We're going to talk about the species and the vulnerability and they are the largest pigeons in the world. And uh, these beauties are usually in command running prices into the thousands of dollars per pair. And here we have a picture of these with the rule rule. Uh, as far as compatibility with other species, I recommend they're in a big enclosure if you're going to have them with smaller birds. Uh, otherwise, they need to be, be by themselves. Uh, they're found only in the forest in New Guinea islands and are rapidly becoming rare because of excessive hunting. Uh, one thing that I saw on a YouTube that the New Guinea people are not hunting with arrows anymore, they're using guns. And with the guns, the, the pigeons have no chances whatsoever. Uh, they're very, very clumsy. They fly up to the tree and they just look at you. And the next thing you know, I saw when I saw that on YouTube, I was just in shock. And they're just shooting them like, just like they're sparrows or crows. And it's very, very sad. Um, here, I'm just telling you, they're from the 2008 IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. Uh, the Victoria Crown Pigeon is listed as vulnerable and is protected under CITES Appendix 2 status. Is killed primarily for food. Unfortunately, they are very good eating, and the feathers are highly prized for ceremonial headdress because a lot of the people in New Guinea do have the headdresses. They they like that. Here we have a map, and if you look, it's the Papua New Guinea is one tenth the size of Australia, and that's only one twenty fifth of of uh, North America. Look at where New Guinea is in comparison to the United States. It's a very very small. Uh, area has 740 birds and nearly one-fifth are migratory with 77 species found only in New Guinea. Here I have a map showing you the range of the three pigeons. We have the range of the Gora Victoria in blue, the range of the Gora Cristata, which is the blue crown pigeon, and then we have the range of the Shimakari and that's in the yellow there. But I want you to notice and keep it in your mind, we have the red and we have the blue kind of overlapping. Unfortunately, in that area, we do have hybridizing of the blue crown and the Victoria crown pigeon, and I hate that word, hybridize, but they do. Here, they do frequent uh, swamp forests, sago forests, as well as drier forests in the wild. And here I'm showing you on this map, the blue area, that they are basically north of New Guinea with the Victoria Crown Pigeons, the lowlands, and it says the Jimmy Valley around 400 to 600 meters. 
And here's a picture of the Seamoth Marie crown pigeon. These are pretty rare here in the United States. I want you to notice right here, this wing is really what makes it different from the crown pigeons and that this wing is white and it's pretty striking. The crest on this one is uh, solid blue. Victoria crown pigeons have the white tips. Also, the blue crown pigeon will also have this blue crest, but the breast on this one is all maroon and goes up lower and higher. And we'll be, look at these in the pictures, but there is quite a difference in the color markings between the Victoria, the blue crown, and the Shimakari. But again, these are considered the, the southern uh, crown pigeon. And here's the range in the yellow. And you can see there's, a, there's lowlands here in the gray that separate that from this Victoria crown and right here with the blue crown. So here's a picture of the common blue crown pigeon. Uh, it's a western crown pigeon also. And if you look at the wings, you'll see that the white on this wing is just a little tad. And again, again on the other, it's a lot of white. And of course, on the Victoria, you'll see in a moment that there is no white whatsoever on the wings of the Victoria, the whites on the tips of the head. Here we have the range by itself in the red of the blue crown pigeon. And right here, here is the Victoria. And this is right here where they, they hybridize, which I'm not too happy about that. But what can you do? Again, I'm showing this, all the different species in this map. And they were talking about if it should be a super species or marked as one species. And that's why I'm showing this. This is what I found on, about the three types of crown pigeons. In captivity, uh, the largest, finest collection anywhere is this bird park in Singapore. And they have all three crown pigeons. And it's fascinating to see all of these together because then you can see the comparison. And it, it's on 20 acres, 5,000 birds, and there's 450 different species from all over the world. So we're going to go over the behavior and vocal. Now when they're walking, they have a low muffled human-like mm, 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 and often muttered by other members of the group. And this is my guy here doing his, his little humming. Now, here's another one that's where they have a, a sound that sounds moose, and it's, it sounds like somebody blowing over the top of an empty bottle of, uh, of milk. And they have booming, a very distinctive booming noise, and it's consistent like five to six notes. And it's kind of a human-like like grunting noise. Next behavior is really impressive. It's the bowing of behavior, and it stands in one place, and the head goes up and down. And in the picture, that's why you can see it's kind of uh, not very clear. He goes up and down, up and down with a boom pa, boom pa, boom pa. I have a CD with music from New Guinea, and they do mimic that with their drums, the same noise as the the crown pigeons booming sound. Uh, normally, you'll see this. When I walk in the room and they, I have certain shoes on, he'll do this booming noise. After copulation, they will boom, the males. It's like saying, I did it, I did it. You know, uh, I wish I had a picture of their copulation, uh, but I don't have that. It's a very unique, uh, where the male will stand on the female's back for quite some time, and he's just balancing himself with his wings like this for a couple of, many seconds. And then after he does his, his thing, he will do the booming sound, showing that he's, he's done. Uh, there's also, when they're threatened, they have a rumbling threat call, and it's a pretty penetrating alarm call. That's him making it. You can see that the feathers on his back are just kind of all opening up, and that shows he's alarmed. And here's another posture that he does also. Uh, it's a very unique one. He will do like a mock run, like he's going to attack you. He runs up, does the wing up, like he's going to hit you, but he doesn't hit you. And that's another thing that I wanted to show on this. And 
And this other one is when he attacks. This is the one I was talking about, the bluff attack. We're going to talk about crown pigeons are, they look the same, DNA sexing or surgically sexing. The only way that you can determine uh, the male and female crown pigeon. I like to use feathers because it's less stress. And it's very, it's well known that they will wing you. I've got a picture of my bird here winging you, especially if it's hand, hand raised. They're very, very prone to coming up to you and winging you. And it's a very memorable experience and not enjoyable. Uh, especially when you're wearing shorts and he hits you on the shin. It's like somebody hitting you with a stick really, really hard, and it hurts. So uh, I don't recommend that you ever experience that, but it has happened. Uh, they stand 25 to 30 inches tall, and they're 5 to 6 pounds as far as their weight. And this is uh, my bird when he was, I let him loose in the yard, and he, that's his favorite stump. I don't know if he thought he was king of the, yard or, or what, but he liked, the, he liked that stump right there. They are, their crests are so unique that they have this lacy feather, it's tipped with the, with the white feathers, and this took quite some time when the chicks are young. I'm going to bring you through from day one all the way to, to now, and you're going to see the, the differences and when the feathers grow in, but uh, this bird's been hunted as much as the bird of paradise for those for these feathers right here, which are the feathers I have in my pocket right here. These fell off naturally. I didn't pull these out. Just so you know, I wouldn't do that. Um, here, I wanted to point out that when he does fly, you can see these gray bars here with the black. And as you can see, I tried to catch him as much as I could when he was flying towards me, and this took quite a bit of coaxing to get him to fly just the right way. Uh, but uh, it's, I guess in the wild, when you see them, you can see these bars to tell which is which. Of course, you'll see the white on top of the crest. But more than anything, when these birds fly, that whoop, 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 to me is the scariest thing, because when my baby fledged, it flew across the yard, it goes whoop, 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 whoop. When I hear that, I think he's flying over the neighbor's yard. So it's like, so be careful if you do have a bird, your pigeons loose because you don't want them to fly to your neighbors who may have dogs. My neighbors don't have any dogs, but still having to jump the fence to get them is not a fun thing. Uh, another distinctive coloration for the Victoria crown pigeon is the gray band on the tail right here. And they do get that right when they start coloring out as chicks. You're going to see a uh, this band here, and they do get a band here in the wing. So if you ever did go out in the wild and you saw some young chicks and you couldn't figure it out, we're gonna, I'll show you that. And you're going to be able to tell by these blue bands on the wings and the blue-gray band here on the end of the tail. Uh, another big trait is the red eyes, beautiful red eyes. Now, when they're born, they're born with gray eyes. But over a period of time, you're going to see those eggs, those eyes turn blood red, as you see right here. And then the dark gray bill with the light gray tip. This is another distinctive marking here, the scaling of the legs. Uh, from the beginning, after a few days, they start to get this. And as they mature, this is, becomes more and more noticeable with the white in between this purplish skin color. And I will tell you also when they are growing, they do shed a lot of skin when they're growing as they go. Here's a juvenile, and it's basically a, a dark color, purple the first year, brown feathers and pale wing patch. And this is what I was talking about. You see the gray right here on the tail. You've got some of the light blue here. The beginning here of the purple breast but the first crest feathers are very disappointing in that they're just blue. They're not with the white tips. That comes later. But the eyes, look how red they are already. And you can see the, the legs here. They've already got that distinctive scaling. And basically, they are really small. They're like, they're like just like cute little, little miniatures of the adults. Now, here's, here's my guy here at, at two years old. This was just taken recently. 
It's a back door. I have a glass back door. And I do give him free roam in the daytime when I'm outside. So he doesn't fly anywhere. And everybody says, you better cut the wings. But I will not cut the wings. Reason being, when they do copulate, they have to be able to jump on the female's back and stand there and balance themselves during that copulation because they, you know, we, we want fertile eggs. The differences between the Gora Victoria, Victoria, there's one called uh, a Bikari, and it's supposed to have a larger crest. Yeah. Now, this is my, uh, this is my baby's crest here, and it kind of divides in the middle. So I, I believe that my female that I have is, could be from that, that subspecies because she is way bigger than the male, her crest is bigger, and the baby crest is, is quite large. And they also differ in that they have 16 feathers instead of the 12 feathers, and they lack an oil gland and a gallbladder. But these aren't all the 16 feathers, they're kind of underneath there also. We're gonna talk about housing. Uh, being that they're size of turkeys, the biggest enclosure, the better. Uh, ideal site would be well-drained, elevated, protected from strong winds and the warm uh, southeasterly aspect. And I got this formula here from my good friend Grimble Rolls. He wrote a book, Rare Pheasants of the World. If you have a chance to get that book that was printed in 76, he has a great section on building aviaries. He goes over all the plant species, and it's very, very, very helpful. But I like his formula, because his formula it says good food, good accommodation, good management, productivity and success. Good food plus attractive accommodation plus good management plus complete natural life in the natural surroundings equals pleasure. Now we're going to go over diet and nutrition. Uh, in the lowlands, they eat seeds, berries, fruits, insects, and small crabs have been found in their stomachs. So here's the food I feed. Uh, mine, they consist of uh, diced fruits, cantaloupe, honeydew, melon, papaya, red delicious apples, pear. They really like the red grapes more than the black grapes, blueberries in moderation. And it's been recorded that they feed whole corn, soft fill mixes, various greens, diced carrot, and they favor figs. And of course, figs are going to be something that you would find in New Guinea, but they're not going to be the big figs that we're talking about. They're called the small figs, very, very small figs. I use Missouri soft fill pellets soaked in warm water. And this right now is something that I use to wean my chick. It's hard to get them to, to eat. And the only way to get pellets, when, they grab, when he grabs for the syringe, I'll stick a few pellets of this warm Missouri. And once he realizes that this is food and he can eat all that he can, this is what he, that's what he eats. He ate this for just a year. He wouldn't even touch the fruit after he started on that. But you want to get him weaned as, as soon as possible. So, but this is kind of a little secret. I love Missouri soft fill pellets and I highly recommend them in the, in the diet. And here I, I show that I, I put the pigeon dove mix with the fresh fruit because the bowl will be empty by the next day. So, and in, in hot, on hot days, I'll check it. I might just put a little bit, and then in the afternoon, I'll put a little bit more to make sure that they're not hungry. They are clumsy birds, so I do recommend uh, a bowl that's set on the floor, because otherwise they will turn it over. They're just kind of curious. Uh, I breed the giant mealworms. They're one of their favorites, but I only feed those in moderation. If you give them too many, they'll eat them all. So I try to feed them just five or six. There's uh, small ones in the picture also. I, I raise both worms because I have other smaller species of birds like blue rules that like mealworms, and it's cheaper to raise them. Uh, the water bowl should be changed uh, daily because they will put fecal matter in there by accident, and you just don't want them drinking water like that. And these are different because they don't sip when they're drinking. Uh, they immerse their bills and they suck up the water when they're drinking, which is kind of a unique thing. When I first saw it, I thought it was kind of strange. Breeding habits. In the wild, the nest is on a solid trunk in a tree, compact structure composed of stems, sticks, palms, lined with cane leaves. Nests are 12 to 50 feet. Uh, this I just took at the Animal Kingdom recently. 
and they have a pair of Victoria Crown pigeons nesting in a tree right above the front door when you walk in. So this is a, you can see here they had all kinds of palm leaves and everything else, things that I would, didn't even think they could make a nest of, but it looks pretty solid. Here's another back view of that nest. They, draw, they nest in the wild in the dry season at the end of rainy season, but here in captivity they do breed all year round. Mine have laid eggs every month, so there is no no set time, especially because y'all live in Florida. So we have the great climate. Here they are bringing nesting material. The male loves to bring nesting material to the female. This is usually before the, the nest is built. She just sits there and just, I, I really believe that uh, adding sticks to your, to that area where they build is very, very important. It's a part of them bonding even closer and closer. So I, I just put so many sticks a day during the nest building so it encourages them to, to be closer and they preen a lot. And here I'm showing the same thing where she's just putting the stick in it. Yeah. There's a lot of aloe preening in there. He will just preen her, preen her and preen her and just make her feel great before the egg comes. Here's the nest that I've used, that I use now. Uh, it's just basically a a basket that's 12 by 24 and 3 and I use plumbago shrubs sticks about 3 to 5 inches and I put oak leaves here on the bottom so that there's something soft. Uh, they do, they're prone to using these big sticks. I'm worried that the egg would get punctured by these huge sticks. So be careful what you put in there because what you put in there is what they're going to put in the nest. You don't want to stick anything with thorns in it for sure. And that's what I mentioned here, was not to give them too much nesting material. I did gave, I gave them beginning, that basket was so high that the egg was about to roll out. And when they want to do a switch off, the female will usually go like this. She's just doing the little wing thing, saying, please take over, please take over. And that's what I'm trying to show here. And also when the male is incubating, he hums a lot on that nest. It's like he's communicating with the, with the egg you know, humming nonstop for the 30 days that they incubate. And here's uh, after the switch off. Usually on the switch off, he'll come right to the edge of the nest, and then she flies off, and then he jumps right in. And here he, it shows that he's getting into the nest to make himself comfortable. Now, when you see this, this is panic. They should never leave that egg. From the moment that egg is laid, it should never be sitting in there like that. That means it, it's an early sign of, of abandonment. Uh, so if you see that, you've got to put that in the incubator right away. So yeah, that, that is not a good picture. I wasn't happy when I took that picture. But that is the product of the egg that I have now. Because when I found it, it was cold. They had been sitting one week. And I put that egg in the incubator. Now, um, as far as the incubation period, it has been documented some hatch at 28 days. 29 days, 30 days. I had one hatch at 32 days, but normally I would say 30 days as a rule. And again, when the parents have a squab, they don't leave that chick unattended. If you have birds at home and they're not sitting on a, on a squab, that means trouble. Uh, this is a story about 1942 when they had a, one hatch in 28 days. And after six days, it was left cold but then the, the keeper stuck it in the uh, incubator for a couple of hours, put it back in the nest, and the female did take it back. So that is a successful story there on that one. So I, and it, it left at seven weeks old. It flew away. That's quite some time uh, to be in the nest. But that's captivity. That's not the wild. Because in the wild, they normally leave the nest between 35, 39 days. I'm going to show you what I do with my artificial incubation and hand rearing. Uh, this is what I just told you. Uh, I use the GFQ Sportsman Incubator. It calibrated at 99.5. The uh, egg did pip at 48 hours before it hatched, and it weighed 30 grams. And we're going to start with this. Now, this is the egg that was just laid four days ago. I kind of wanted to show you how it looks kind of round, very, very round egg. And I'm going to go very quickly through this next stage. This, as far as this, this pipping, this was at 48 hours. When it pipped for the very first time, 
um, it wouldn't make any vocal noises. But then after it, after so, I guess about 12 hours, you could hear it through the incubator. I could hear it in the next room, and it would just it would just call and call and call. Being that it was my first egg, I didn't know how long it was supposed to pip, so I was a nervous wreck. But it, it's 48 hours to 52 hours is not uncommon. So if you do have an egg in the incubator, don't be don't try to help it. Just let it do its thing because from this stage on to this next picture, it was 15 minutes from the time that he got out from the beginning. I put water on the outside of the egg. Here he is. You see a wing popping out the other way? Right here he got stuck. And he was stuck with that for a little bit. And I was getting a little worried, but I just let him kick. Kick again. And there he is, voila. And what I did as far as uh, sexing this one, I sent the eggshells in. Uh, Avian Biotech now has a technology where they, you can send in the eggshells. And with that membrane, they can determine whether it's a male or female. And that's what I did with this guy. And there he is. So this is my, my boy at 30 grams. It's day one. And I really wanted to notice that he's, he's pink in color on day one. By day three, these guys turn almost black. Uh, it may be for protective coloration. It may be for that reason. And another thing I wanted to stress was I put these guys on sticks from day one. It's very important that when you're raising Victoria crown pigeons or any kind of crown pigeons, putting them on sticks, just like their natural habitat, will prevent spray legs. Uh, spray legs are not a good thing for a ground bird, especially a crown pigeon. So the only way to prevent that is to make sure you have sticks underneath him so he doesn't go this way. He wants to keep his feet underneath him. And I, I got this tip from another person who raises crown pigeons who learned the hard way. And from that moment on, I'm using this, te this technique of sticks in the bowl at all times. These are the things I use for when I'm having the chick hatch. Uh, I use the KT Handering formula for baby birds. Uh, Gerber baby food, which takes the place because they're fruit pigeons. Usually in the past, you use pureed fruit. We don't need to puree fruit anymore. With the Gerber baby food, you've got pureed, pureed fruit here. I like the fruit medley myself. Uh, it's pretty good, not for myself to eat. I didn't mean it that way. I meant it. I like that the bird likes the fruit medley. I mean, you have to taste it to make sure it's not bad. Right? You know, that's right. This look, may look odd to you, but it is a vitamin gel. And I do put that in there, uh, either for adult dogs or puppies. Now, more importantly than anything, when you're doing the hand rearing formula, you've got to follow directions in this bag here. It is very, very helpful. It tells you how many teaspoons of the food to how many teaspoons of liquid. And I use Pedialyte to give them a boost in the beginning. This is another thing that you might laugh at, but I use it, and that's a thermometer, so that I know that it's between 102 and 105 degrees, because if it's not, it's not good. This is what we put. I put on the bottom when he comes out of the egg. I use this. As far as to regulate temperature, uh, at my O-House scale I use religiously. I have two. I weigh them before the feeding. After the feeding, I record how many cc's went into that to him and I, everything. So if anybody in the future needs any kind of calendar, I know somebody's got blue crowns here, I'll be glad to assist you and give you all the records that I have because I wanted to make something that somebody could follow. I couldn't, I had nothing. So now I'm going to make sure that if anybody has from day one to two years, I have all that documented. How many cc's, what was the temperature? I, and it, I know it sounds very weird, but once you become an animal keeper, I was in the private sector, I learned about records. This is where I'm stretching records. I've got stuff now that I can give to you, you, and you if you should come into that situation, you want to know how much should he weigh at three days old? What should I feed him? Well, now, now we have that. So, and I'm willing to share that any, any time. But uh, here I was going over 
the uh, recipe. Joe and Judy Pasatino were the ones that basically gave me this recipe, along with John Boris, who are great friends and have been there. I would call at midnight and say, help, you know, he doesn't look right. You know, what do I do? Just like a daunting dad. Uh, but these are all the ingredients that we just talked about. And you'll see that on the, you saw it on the last picture. Uh, preparation must be done for every feeding. You don't skimp. You don't try to save food. Uh, I have uh, personally have learned with other species that you don't save food. I know mean, it sounds tempting, but you make it and you throw it away. I know I make a whole serving and I throw away a lot. But you know what? Isn't your bird worth that? Don't you think? So I don't mind throwing away a lot because I know that in the long run, I'm going to have a healthy baby and no bacteria and nothing like that. And another thing that I was going to tell you is when you're making this recipe, make sure you just boil the water or the Pedialyte. You don't put all the food together and throw it in the microwave. You will mess it up and you don't want to mess it up. So here again, here's the, here's the, how we make it, how I made that for the first feeding, one teaspoon of the formula. I put half a teaspoon of the fruit, a pinch of the vitamin, the six teaspoons of the Pedialyte, and this is hot water that you mix in a glass bowl, not a plastic bowl. Plastic bowls are not really good. You want to use glass bowls always, not plastic. And the temperature 102 to 105, and it should have a consistency of uh, cream pudding. I use that, I put here that I put the talking thermometer. Yes, I have this Walgreens thermometer and it talks to me and tells me what the temperature is. It's kind of crazy, but anyway, here I was talking about what you don't do. Uh, I put them at 95 degrees in the beginning and then you bring the temperatures down. Now every few days you kind of monitor the squab. If he looks lethargic, you know, you've got to either go up or down, you know, as far as on your temperature. This is pretty much anybody who raises carrots or hand raises any kind of bird, you know what I'm talking about. And it's the same with the, with the squabs. Now the great thing, uh, crop, when you are feeding them, you can see how much you're feeding them. So don't overfeed. The crop must empty before and af after every feeding. I mean, it has to empty completely. Don't, I know he's gonna say he's hungry, but don't listen to what he says. That crop has gotta be empty, and then you go to the next feeding. Otherwise, you've got trouble. Here I went through the whole schedule. I'm not going to read these off to you, but I do have these there. And I talked about, you know, the first pip. Then when he became vocal, when he came out, I have all everything documented 100%. You know, as far as how many cc's, fed 1.5 cc, before, after, weighed him after, all that stuff is here. But I, I went through all that and documented only for the sake of helping everybody who has or attempts to raise a Victoria crown pigeon or a crown pigeon in general. So all that's here. I stopped at, you know, so many days because it is a lot of material. Now they will double their weight in, in, in a week. Uh, after one week, the eyes open, pen feathers come, and then within two weeks, they have that crest coming. Here are the stages of development. Day one, here you can see it's pink. It's kind of a light pink, it should be darker. This is a different picture. I kind of got the pictures mis mixed up here, but it's turning dark here on day three. Very dark by day five. Again, my theory is in the wild, you want to have them dark so they fit. They don't stick out in that nest, but they're never going to be uncovered anyway. I want you to notice here, look at the feathers, how quickly they're starting to grow here on the wings at day five. Here's day seven. You can see the little, there's gonna be like little soft stuff here coming out on the pen feathers. You're gonna see more feathers. These are gonna to start to become pen feathers over a period of time. There is no crest here yet. And his eye, the eye sockets are huge. I mean, it looks like an ugly dinosaur. Here we have more feathers coming out at day eight. And again, he's just sitting there kind of helpless. Here's day 12. He's up to 92 grams, feeding number 70. And you've got, see these feathers here? You've got these pen feathers starting to come out of the back. But still no definite crest yet at 
day 12. Day 15, I know these pictures are not the best quality. You've got a little crest right there, 96 grams, and you can see the feathers coming out of the wing and on the back, and the tails have pin feathers too. But it's really exciting to see when the crest is starting to come out at day 15. Day 17, 100 grams. Now he's starting to straddle. Right about this time, it's like their feet grow overnight. And it's very alarming because I thought he was spray leg. And being that I'd never had him before, I took him to the vet for a checkout. I, I have a great avian uh, vet in Orlando, uh, Dr. Porter, who worked at SeaWorld. So if you're lucky enough to have a great avian vet, I highly recommend that you find an avian vet. Even if they're not in your same city, you've got to go to an avian vet because you can't go to a dog or cat person. They're not going to know what to do. Uh, here you can see 118 grams at day 19. You can see the crest coming out here and more pen feathers. Day 21, the crest is even growing more. And you've got feathers already here. The wing feathers are already shown about this much out by day 21. Here's a picture, I think, that's one that's 56 days and one that's about, I guess, about three weeks old, two weeks old. I, I forgot to document the time. This is from another friend of mine that I got these pictures from. But I wanted you to show the difference between the stages. As you can see on the one on the left, the eyes are already starting to turn red. Over here, they're still dark. So right now, there's... Now here the chick at 24 days, 154 grams, and the pen feathers. Now on those pen feathers, these guys are preening themselves almost 24-7. And all of the, the little flaked scales are all over the place. So you have to change the bedding quite a bit. Because you can just blow up, and there all that stuff goes. Here he is at day 30. And the pen feathers are coming out like crazy. All along the breast, all along the back, the crest up here. And you can see these feathers kind of a light gray already. Here he is standing, my proudest moment in the worst picture. But day 36, he was standing and walking. And he is the clumsiest little guy. He almost looked like a dodo bird walking around. But here he is at day 36. Day 39. He sits on his bowl. Top view, day 39. Sunning, day 40, loves the sun. And on number 43, I'm holding him and he likes to, like anywhere the sun is, he's opening. But I just wanted you to see how you can see all the feathers growing here. Here's the front view of the same. <coughs> You can see all the feather growth here. 45. A lot of feathers here on the bottom, like down, very, very soft. Side view, day 45. Day 52, very, very soft feathers. Again, you want to see, you can see the gray bars here in the tail. This is another exciting moment. He picks up the white sunflower or seed, but he doesn't swallow. He throws this all around the room and picks it up, but he will not eat. And I was really hoping at this point that he would be uh, learning to eat, but he didn't. It was the Missouri soft oil pellets that did it. The warm pellet, and this wasn't warm. But again, this was his little toy. This was his enrichment, throwing around the seed. Here he is on the counter. Day 74, uh, out in the yard, I keep, I'm keep out in the yard with him. He loves the sun. And you can see how huge these feathers are. Day 74, again, day 86. I want you to notice all this purple. The purple is coming really, really heavy now. And look at the eyes. The eyes are already uh, a bright red at day 86. Here he is here. Day 86 again. And then at day 86, he flies in. What was that? What he did is, when he knew I had a syringe, he would fly up to me. He, want, he, he would, This is when he flew up to me. He flew right up into my hand. And this is him flying to my hand. And there he is. 
So he was, you know, if you had a syringe, he was ready. So I wish I had kept that trait going where he would fly, but I really don't want a pet. I want a breeder. But he, yeah. And he would follow me, of course. This is him outside. And you can see the changes here at five months old. Look how he's getting, so he's getting the black around the eyes. You can see all this beautiful blue. It's coming lighter blue than dark blue. He's got that purple chest coming in heavier. And his feathers, these are the big, big feathers that help him fly. Here he is very inquisitive at six months old. Over my lettuce garden, he likes to pull things out of the ground just to destroy. So, especially seedlings, because I had a garden. He, if he saw one little plant, he just pulled it out. Just to pull it out. You know, I get, I, again, enrichment. Here he is at one year. Now you can see that he's he's got almost everything that a, a, an adult would have already. He's got these bars here. He's got the defined black around the eyes. He's got the white tips in his crest. And here he is at eight months old, sitting on my lap. I got him there. When I sit on when I sit in the backyard, he likes to come and just jump on me. I think he kind of forgets that he can't. He's not eating from a syringe anymore. But I try to knock him from that because I don't, again, I don't condone, I don't want a pet. I want him to breed. And here I'm just talking, saying that the species preservation, that keeping these in captivity is the only way to maintain these species at, in reasonable numbers. And here are the feathers that I kind of gathered. And this is what you would probably see me getting because they're eating my chickens. I have my special thanks here to quite a few people, Dr. Burnham. Uh, Grimble Rolls, uh, quite a few, Sherry Han and I put Lynn Hall because he's always been a source of information. And San Antonio Zoo for inspiring children like me. And my Dame Sefting, who is a, a man who brought me my birds for the first time when I was just a little kid. And I took most of those pictures. My surprise is coming right here. Oh, so thank, thank you, you so, much so for much. This finger. It's just a delight. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, guys. Sure. Makari does have a crest that comes turned on on a bill and says, hi. The one thing that anybody in this room that lives north of the nation takes in a while, brown pigeons seem no problem. Oh, I forgot to tell you the last two things here. Uh, there's a new stud book keeper. It's Wendy Wadsworth in North Carolina Zoo, and she just took over. And there's another guy that I'm corresponding with in Europe. He's got their stud book. I guess Jokey Nihibor. I'm not too good at the but he's at a water dam zoo. And then this was assembled by my great friend, Anthony Bradburn, who loves science, and I couldn't have done this without him. He's a librarian and a computer person and, and helped me put it all together. And he's also a bird watcher, too. I'm gonna bring out my, my guy here, and we're gonna, uh, is the back door closed? All right, guys, everybody, everybody's a bird person. And I will warn you here that if he takes a flight, he will come back. So just don't be, just dock and I'll get him. Yeah. I think that, um, let me see if he's not too alarmed. No, he came to John. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we might. Yeah, we'll take pictures with the light up, but overall, I want to bring the lights down eventually so he doesn't uh, freak out too much. Oh.